Oh, hello. <laughs> My name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for May 26th, 2013. Tonight, we have the moon. And it's the bad moon, too. It's the bright moon that's making everyone else's lives miserable tonight. You know, I was wondering, I did see a bad moon. Not right the here. good moon. The good moon is going to have that nice little slender crescent that looks really great and doesn't really, you know blow out everyone else's telescope. So, joining us tonight, we've got Andrew Dumbleton, who is joining us from England and is attempting to operate his remote telescope. What's going on, Andrew? Morning, Fraser. Yes, we've got uh, roofs delayed opening uh, today because of local weather, but uh, I'll keep an eye on it. And you can't just go over there and, and just push on them? Yeah, just a few thousand miles. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, David Dickinson, who's in Florida, giving hey, us hey. this beautiful view of the moon. It's a rare dewless night here too. There's actually no dew, so yeah, it doesn't it's look very as, rare. It doesn't look very murky. It looks like a really clear view tonight. Yeah, the moon's about 20 degrees below the horizon here right now, so it's it's, uh, it's getting better. That's going to keep coming up there. What's that crater there? That is my face of the moon app here says that it is La Lagrangeus. Lagrangeus. Yeah. Lagrinus. Faces of the, the Moon app. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my. I don't have an app on me. No, oh, no, wow. no underhand pitches, guys. Come on. <laughs> All right. We actually just pushed an update. I think today, today maybe or maybe tomorrow we're gonna have a new update with a whole bunch of new features, high resolution uh, images now. So it's gonna be a lot nicer. It's super high def. Super high def. Ultra high def, yeah. Uh, Actually, got... my, my favorite feature is the fact that you can set it as a live wallpaper. Yeah. Because yeah. that's just cool. Yeah, Because it's, it's on your lock screen and everything. Uh, so we've got Gary Ganella in Los Angeles. Hey, Gary. Hi, everybody. We've got uh, some guy we haven't seen in a long time, but we really missed him, Michael Phillips. Hello, everybody. I'm, and I'm if, happy if, to be under clear skies, actually. And if, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Well, it's been week after week of you having yep. really awful skies. And, yep. um, and if people recall, Mike is the person who brought us Saturn in that first, um, that first video, that Google video that they, that they did. So uh, if you just imagine that Saturn slowly panning down. Can you back, bring it a little bit down, Mike? A little bit down. <laughs> little bit down. But now he's going to change cameras. But yeah, we're going to go to the color one. So yes. I won't change it back. And then just down the road from Mike Phillips, we've got uh, Mitchell Duke, who we also haven't seen in a little while. Hey, Mitchell. Hey, guys. And the uh, and the view of Saturn is terrific. Look at that! Look at that Saturn. See the Cassini division it looks great. Yeah. Yeah, that's just wonderful. I wonder if you can like maximize this window. Can you maximize this window and get rid of all the other controls? Yeah, let me play around with it. Yeah, you can just like maximize the the Saturn window. But anyway, we'll keep moving. Uh, we got Roy Salisbury, who is actually on location at his observatory as opposed to controlling it remotely and so but then we don't get to see your your face you're you have no, no. camera <laughs> where you are so you're just so, a talking galaxy so yes you're... i'm a talking i'm a talking galaxy with a disembodied telescope <laughs> no, but, but at least the now if the focus is a little off or it's not performing you can just you know Hit actually I mean, go over and give it a bang so Yes, and that's that, why I'm here. I'm that, I'm doing adjustments to the optics. Perfect. Nice. My co-host Scott Lewis. How's it going, everyone? And Doctor Thad Zabo. Good evening. All right. So let's uh, let's start with this beautiful view of the moon. So, and I think the thing that just pops right out with this view is that crazy, cr like the crater, and then that peak right in the middle, yeah, you and you can, can see the shadow of that yeah. peak against that back crater wall. If, if you were at that peak right there, you'd be watching a crescent Earth rise right mm -hmm. there along the Terminator, so you'd see the Earth in the opposite phase. The moon is, is waning gibbous right now. It just has full. So, so what's the Terminator? It's just a shadow area right there where the sun's just starting to rise right along the edge. The Terminator is the line between sunrise and sunset on the moon. <laughs> and on one side you see the sun, on the other side you don't. <laughs> Come with me if you want to live. Get in the space chopper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, wow. That's great. So how, how much of the month would you be able to see this, you know, this peak illuminated in this way? Roughly, roughly half. I mean, this this crater, this is uh, Langrinus. Um, it shows up shortly after 
uh, waxing crescent. I mean, this becomes visible very early in the lunar cycle. And now that you can see that it's on the Terminator, meaning that this is probably the last night that it will in this um, 29 and a half day cycle for lunar phases, this is probably be the last night that it actually has light falling on it and will be, um, will be visible until, you know, next lunar cycle starts. Yeah. So, but, yeah, yeah but, pretty, pretty much next week that the accursed moon will be gone. Yes. Sunrise to sunset roughly, yeah, two weeks. Yeah. So just to let people know, you can actually make comments, questions, feedback. You can make requests. We'll uh, we'll do what we can to bring up your favorite objects tonight. Uh, so there's a few ways to do that. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube, you can make a comment there. If you're watching this somewhere out on the internet, uh, you can use the hashtag, uh, uh, um, sorry, Star Party on Star Twitter. Party. Yes. Uh, if you're watching, um, if you're watching this on Google Plus on the event page, you can make a comment there. And if you're watching this just in my, from my stream, you can uh, make a comment there, and hopefully we'll we'll pick up the comment. If you're if you think we're not like wa seeing your comments, the safest place is to comment on YouTube. We'll YouTube, absolutely see right. them there. So, but we do have it set up right now that should be tracking all the comments everywhere yeah. except for Facebook. But yeah. You know. <laughs> oh really? Are you have I, you embedded it on Facebook? I have it on Facebook. Yeah, on our new virtual star party page. Right, right. So if you're if you're watching this on it's Facebook, link, it's linking to your YouTube because uh, yeah, if you're watching this on Facebook, click on the link and and, and yeah. make comments on YouTube. And so yeah, if if you have any questions about the gear that we're using, about the technique, about the people, their setups, or just that lovely beard general... that Fraser's rocking right now. Any questions <laughs> yeah, about like that? This? <laughs> this? Yeah. I think it's um, I think it's hockey playoff time. That's is what it? I think. No, yeah. no, I uh, I just. Sometimes have a beard. No, Fraser's a curling man. He's not Fraser. <laughs> curling is a Canadian thing. Yeah. Sweep. Long bachi of the north. <laughs> All right, I got to spend some time now with with uh, with the Michael and and Mitchell's uh, Saturns here. So so you did change to color. I did change to color. Yes, and uh, I think it's a fairly accurate representation. And most of the process images that I come out with, it's got this kind of yellowish hue to it. Um, and for those fuzzy, of us but... who haven't seen the uh, the Google video, what is the uh, telescope that you're using? So this is my home-built 14-inch uh, Newtonian. It's a native uh, focal ratio of f4.5, and, and I use a power mate uh, to magnify it 5x times, so it's uh, around f, I don't know, 29 or something like that. And uh, I'm using a color camera from the image source right now to just display a live view straight through um, into the hangout. Right. And I think, you know, again, we, you know, we mentioned this video, the Google video. If you do a search for Virtual Star Party on, on YouTube, you should find it, and you can actually see some yeah. video of Mike wheeling this uh, this gigantic <laughs> telescope around. And it's it's big. It's a beast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Home built. Have wheels will travel, and, uh, and uh, if you notice, there's a bit of an incline to my driveway here. And uh, the guy that helped build the tube for me, he he's very astounded that I wheel this thing up and down the driveway. <laughs> Do you? Is it up both ways, or how does that work for you? <laughs> yes. How how high is Saturn for you right now, Mike? Um, I don't have an exact, but I think it peaks around just around 40 or just less than 40 degrees above the horizon. So not great, and I think it gets worse year over year from here. So is it is it at the sort of maximum height right now? It's about an hour past. Maybe. Okay. So I think this you know it's, it only gets worse from here. Let's say so. <laughs> we're we're in a cycle of oppositions for the next decade where it's going to be getting to the yeah. more southern part of the ecliptic. All right. I'm switching to to Mitchell's view now. So Mitchell, what's your telescope there. setup? I don't know if you can hear us. Is he muted? I know what he has if he okay. doesn't answer. <laughs> yeah, he's got a Celestron 14-inch Schmidt Cassegrain, and uh, he just picked up a new camera that I think he's he's been playing playing around with, having some pretty good success with. It's um. Hey, it's I'm here, guys. There you are. Go ahead. Okay. You talk. You talk. <laughs> I guess I was muted. Um, I'm using a Celestron 14-inch and an ASI 120 millimeter camera. No, yeah, not it looks it looks great. Monochrome. I mean. <laughs> I mean, I mean, weren't you guys thinking that you were seeing the hexagon? Yeah. Or, or was that just me being crazy? Uh, good seeing, maybe, but right now it's kind of blurry. You get hints of it every once in a while when it settles down. I mean, there's definitely yeah. a darker region around the North Pole there. Yeah, so. I don't know if people watching this can see this. 
But I think the tricky part is, is is there's a contrast in color and and shading between the that area and the surrounding bands, and so you can see it. It's the it's really the the, the polar cap. So it's that dark spot right at the bottom of of Mitchell and uh, more Mitchell's image than mine, and. I think the trick is to actually see the sort of angled corners to it, which it, it's really difficult to see on, on the live display. But it does pop out when you, when you hit it with some post-processing sharpening tools, let's say. Magic. See, I don't know whether I like it in black and white or I like it in color better. Like, the color, see, you really get the, <laughs> those colors, that, that yes. really nice yellow Can you get color both that you see. at the same time? Yeah, I'm just I'm just going back and forth. Click. Yeah, click. I, I think the real I think click. the real trick for me is, and this is why click. I went monochrome, is that the monochrome images tend to have a uh, higher frame rates, which frees the seeing a lot more, and so it looks like a sharper view. And 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 using lower frame rates, you, you you're subject to a little bit more of the atmosphere's mercy, which is not yeah. so great right now. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple of questions already. So Chet uh, eleven thirty eight asks. Um, what uh, mount do you use with your Newtonian, uh, Michael? I went brave, and that's a good question, because I went with the Celestron CGE, which, if you ask, Celestron is rated at 65 pounds. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to build a telescope for 65 pounds. <laughs> and, and I went right, right up to the maximum. <laughs> and I, I will tell you, I've had some pretty good success with it, not just for planetary, but I've got an off-axis guider that I've been playing around with for the last year or so, and getting some pretty good results for deep sky stuff, too. So... It, it, it's a pretty good mount. I don't yeah. know if they sell it anymore. I think they've been trying to push people to the pro model, which is tremendously more cost. Yeah. But it, it's been working pretty good. Right, and I mean, it, you know, it's holding really steady. Yeah. It's a rock. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty good. And I, and I actually had some, some computer woes, which meant that every time I had a computer woe, I had to realign it. So um, hastily, it's been held, holding up pretty well so far. And so we've got a question here from Stephen Birch. What is magnification is this view of Saturn? You guys pretty much have the same focal ratio, so... Yeah, it's pretty close. I'd say they're right around 10,000 millimeters. So which... what is the... Uh, yeah, and so what would you say the magnification is of this? Uh, I know astronomers don't tend to talk that way, right? Yeah, I mean, it if you... your ambiguous. That, what would, you, what would you think this is? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I've, I've been trying to do more visual work, because uh, why not, right? And I think it's around three or 400 X, just roughly taking a stab at it. I mean, yeah, that, that would sound right. I mean, computing it, if you have an eyepiece in and you're doing it visually, is, is much easier. You take the focal length of your telescope and divide by the focal length of the eyepiece. Um, I actually need to do a bit of a refresher on how to do it with a with a camera in there. Um, right. I mean, yeah, it's it's not uh, it's not as not quite as straightforward. Um, but just from what I've seen from other views of Saturn, it, yeah, probably probably around that 400 magnification yeah. range seems about right. Yeah. And you really need you really need a lot of aperture to get a good bright view of Saturn at that kind of magnification. We kind of forget, you know, we look at Jupiter. Well, Jupiter is twice as close to the sun as Saturn is, meaning Saturn gets four times less light than Jupiter. So you really have to, you know, increase your exposure um, compared to when you're you're shooting Jupiter, and that leaves you more vulnerable to to atmospheric effects. So yeah, having a 14-inch scope like um, like Mike or, or Mitchell have here is just really, um, I won't say necessary, but it definitely kind of optimizes things for trying to, to get a good bright um, image of Saturn. So we're trying to bring up Titan or one of the, some of the moons now, Mike? Is that... Uh, There's one. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I figured we're talking about brightness, and I, I know this one here. I don't know if that's Tethys or... I don't have my ephemeris up there, and, and I think Titan's off to the side, if I remember seeing it in the IP. So if people are kind of confused what, what's happened here, so the moons of, of Saturn are really faint, and so in order to see both, the to see the moons, you have to really increase the brightness, and what that does is that blows out Saturn, but then you can see these little faint objects, which are the moons. Uh, we have one other question here. Um, uh... And Grip wants to know, can Neptune or Uranus be seen at this time of year with the gear in use on the VSP? And actually, we did have Neptune and Uranus and Pluto uh, roughly this time of year last year, didn't we? 
trying to remember. I thought it was it was warmer than it is now, although it's been an unseasonably cold yeah. spring here. I it, it, it wouldn't be now. I mean, Neptune is in yeah, Neptune is in Aqu Aquarius or Capricorn. Uranus yeah. is in Pisces. So if um, so, Andrew might be able to get a shot at them if if he's got dark enough skies because they'd be they'd be morning objects at this point. So Andrew being in the UK, it's you yeah. know, near sunrise for him. So. Um, but for anybody in the U.S., you'd, you'd be waiting until, you know, shortly. Well, you know, let me think. For for Neptune, till probably about two two to three a.m. and Uranus, not very um, long before sunrise. Before you'd have it high enough in the yeah. sky to be able to see. Yeah. Pluto would be difficult right now because uh, the moon's going to occult it later today. So the moon is very close really to it. really <laughs> wow. <laughs> but huh. uh, but uh, you won't see an occultation like that because Pluto is way too faint. Right, but we but we would see Pluto, mm. and then probably a couple of months from now, and then yeah, it's, it's in Sagittarius right now. So it's in the yeah. if you're looking in the direction of the moon that I'm aimed at right now, you're in the rough direction of Pluto. Yeah, uh, and New Horizons is in, in that same direction too. That's great. But if uh, we're talking brightness differences here, I mean, the moon full moon is around magnitude negative twelve. Pluto is right around magnitude 14. That's 26 um, magnitudes difference. So that's roughly um, 100 to the. Is that 100 to the fifth power? Yeah, that's 100 <laughs> to the fifth power difference in brightness. That's 10 billion times difference in brightness between the moon and Pluto. So yeah, if you have the moon in there, there is no camera right. sensitive enough anywhere. I, man I managed two nights ago to film an occultation of Beta Scorpii, which is third magnitude. And <laughs> it was very difficult on the limb of the full moon. It was nearly impossible to see. And that was at third magnitude. <laughs> yeah, that's a naked eye star. That's an easy naked eye star. So, But when yeah. it pops out the dark side, would you be able to see... Uh, I mean, I have third magnitude there. would be able to see a lot easier, right? But I mean, oh, could yeah. you see something down to 10th or 14th magnitude? To my knowledge, I've, I've never heard of anyone... Catch, there, there's a series of occultations of Pluto this year. Almost every lunation it occults it. But mm. to my knowledge, I've never heard of anyone catching one. That would be very difficult. I would think you'd have to be in the right place at the right time, right? Because you can't yeah. see the dark side of the moon, and you don't know where Pluto is, so... It'd be better to get it when it's a crescent or a first quarter or right. something like that. Yeah. 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 Did you pull up a... You pull up a satellite there? It's satellite definitely... That Titan? There's, yeah, I think it might be. If somebody can pull it up, there's... Blair will tell you, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's one here, and mine, mine is inverted from, from Mitchell's. I didn't rotate my camera the right way. And are you, are you doing the same here. thing, Mitchell? Let me see what Mitchell's view has. Yeah, I got some... And here's the real problem with trying to catch these occultations of Pluto at this point. Right. It would be the darker, unlit edge of the moon that would be covering it first, and then it would be re-emerging on the bright edge. You would have yeah. to know exactly where you're aiming yeah. to get to see the, the disappearance there. So, yeah, very tricky. Maybe something for October or possibly November yeah. um, when the, the crescent moon would be thin enough that it wouldn't blow out your camera while trying yeah. to, to get the dark limb of the moon covering Pluto. Oh, there you go, Mitchell. Yeah, we yeah. we're seeing it there. Yeah, that's terrific. Now, I, I wanted to take a quick break here since Michael is here, and we've been having our been going through all the images from our photo contest. And one of the the main things we have this huge banner now on Google Plus that we are trying to find a good use of that real estate. And one of Michael's submissions, I think, is going to be perfect for it. And so instead of me emailing <laughs> you and asking you. You can here. ask me here, sure. So here is one of your just composite of many of your different images that yes. you've done through the, the Venus transit, and we have the Moon and Jupiter and Saturn. So we would like to use this for our banner. Is that okay with you? For hey, I, I'm banner? giving you a big thumbs up right now, and if you awesome. want the one without all the labels on it, I can give you that one too. Great, great. So, oh, so awesome. we'll get this set up. But yeah, just all the images you have in here. In here, all the objects. I think it'd be a perfect way to showcase all the. And I think it's been... important for people to see this, right? These are the images that Mike. These are the images that Michael has has taken, and and I'm, 
I'm looking through the objects, and we've seen them all. I think, yeah, I, I yes. do try to. It might not be the ones that were on the Virtual Star Party. Yeah. But yeah. To, to me, when I do these, and I was actually inspired by Mike Solway. I don't know if he watches the uh, Star Parties or not, but he, he did this at the end of the year, and I'm like, that's actually really cool. Kind of, you know, yeah. set yourself a, like a yearly goal, and it becomes like a New Year's resolution to go, I'm going to get all these objects in this year, and they're going to be better than last year. Yeah. And just, you know, some, some fun so, to assemble at the end of the year to say. That's really cool. Uh, so I'm going to move over just to this, the All Sky view that Andrew's got. Which is really neat. I really like this. Yeah, it's about all I have at the moment. Um, <laughs> Look at those closed <laughs> telescope domes. <laughs> Let me flick between one which was earlier. So uh, if I go to the previous All Sky, um, you can see the moon is down at this point. So there's a bank of cloud over this area. Um, unfortunately, this half of the sky was was absolutely clear. So Leo, I could have shot uh, galaxies in Leo around Ursa Major, um, but, but this half of the sky is, is, is bad. Uh, and if I move to the, the next all sky that came, the moon you can see is just coming up. This bank of cloud is still here and there's some more cloud around this horizon starting to appear. So it seems to be getting worse, I'm afraid. <laughs> and the whole can't get the telescope up. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'm getting an echo from you, Andrew, just to let you know. I'm going to have to mute you. Okay, to I'll here. go to, uh, to mute that. All right, well, I'm going to move to Gary's view because I know he's... Oh. I'm still getting an echo. Yeah. There, okay. All right, well, I'm going to go to Gary's view because I know he's been waiting patiently with this beautiful view of M51 and even put the name on it. Yep, no problem. I'm actually enjoying this one. I don't have to rush as much. <laughs> I know, normally the pressure's <laughs> on. Gary, come on, more, more, more. Oh, no, you still have around, to do them. I still need got... those images later, so yeah, keep going, yeah. Gary. Yeah. Gary, I'll take a bullet for you any day, man. You're, you're all right. <laughs> Thanks, I really Well, but you, I've been, you know, wanting to see Saturn all season. I'm like, come on. I've been pushing poor David to get these low <laughs> images of Saturn, and now, boom, here we are. It's great. We really needed some southern hemisphere people to come and come on board, though, because Saturn's going to be, you know, quite high in the sky for them. So Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Nice M fifty one, and you're and you're battling the moon. So, actually, not right at the moment. It hasn't come up for me yet. Oh, really? Okay. It's, it's hanging right just below the horizon. So it'll be there just shortly. Yeah, I'm I'm actually battling fairly not nice skies. I've got a little bit of haze. The seeing's not great. Yeah, it's kind of crummy out. But Is that uh, that's my fifty one, and there's the full frame. And I'm going to move to Roy Salisbury. Oh, that's nice. So that's M M eighty one, M eighty one, and so Roy, I know people like to know what's your setup. What gear? What telescope are you using? Um, tonight this is with a ten inch RC, um, which is about two thousand millimeter focal length. That's great. And so remember what uh, what Michael was saying that it, you know he's running a ten thousand millimeter focal length. So yeah, it's. <laughs> Yeah, so we need a much wider field of view for galaxies, especially M81 because it is so nearby, only 12 million light years. So, um, and, and it's a real, is it an analog of what the Milky Way looks like? Not really. Um, no. Yeah, the, the, the nucleus is a little bit too spherical. For, for the Milky Way, it's a barred nucleus. Actually, I guess if line cork here that's not I mean imagine this a little bit longer right that would be kind of the bar for the, the, the nucleus for the Milky Way as opposed to a ball like for uh, for M81 here um, but I mean yeah the, the Milky Way would be a spiral not not quite as much this grand design though as we see with um, with M81 where you, you kind of have the the disk and then you can just see the spiral arms coming off of, of each each edge here instead for the Milky Way it's a bar and then you have some spiral arms coming off the edge and then there's some extra spurs and other little portions of arms that kind of fill in the um, the regions in between um, not nearly as nice and symmetric as, uh, as yeah. M81 looks here um, Funny Dragon 11 asks is this live how does this work uh, <laughs> yes this is live, live. This is the um, and the, yeah. how this works is you watch as we bring different objects up so these are all live telescopes so right now we have one two three four five six live views of the night sky and so we can ask these astronomers to move their telescopes around to different objects we have two views of Saturn right now one view of the moon an all sky view and uh, some deep sky objects. So that's it. So I've got about six of them queued up whenever you're ready. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Well, then uh, I want to go back to David's view because he's got a great view of the moon first, and then you can p- feel free to put up another image. Right. I, I can see Gary already has two. He's, he's already moving ahead, too. I moved over to the Mara Chrysium there right on the Terminator as well. It just You can see kind of what my field of view is with this is kind of fixed, and it just fills it up right now. Yeah. Yeah, so this, again, this feature, um, it's a plane that filled with lava about three and a half billion years ago, uh, back when the moon still had active uh, volcanic flows, and hasn't been hit too often. This is, this is the side that's facing Earth, so the Earth kind of acts as a little bit of a shield for um, meteorite impacts. So we see that this lava plane is still largely intact. There's some good-sized craters in there, but it's not nearly as roughed up as, say, with the far side of the moon looks like. So it's um, you know, a feature on the, the far um, eastern limb of the moon. Uh, eastern, if you're looking at it as a globe, actually on the sky from here, it's the western, it'd be the western edge. Uh, but if you're looking at the moon as a globe, it's the, the eastern edge. And you know, at waxing crescent, when the moon's only about two or three days old, you get this nice spill of light into it, kind of the opposite effect of what we're getting now, where it's shadow kind of spilling in the same way that the light would spill in when it's a, a very young crescent moon. Oh, it always amazes terrific. me we never we never saw that far side until the space age. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's surprising how different it looks. Yeah. From it's, the from the near side. I mean you, you would expect the far side would just look the same as the near side, but actually you, it looks you've quite probably different. seen you've probably seen those first Luna two images that the Russians took and they're they're really terrible images. <laughs> You can barely make out any detail on them, but it was it's still amazing that they managed to do it. So Miles uh, Beardsmore, I like the name, uh, says they saw Saturn in the Southern Hemisphere a day ago, and it was great. So, um, yeah. yeah, this is much higher up for them. I mean, right now it's it's kind of slipping from from um, Virgo into Libra, which puts it pretty far to the south for for Northern Hemisphere observers from the, the same latitudes as the U.S., but if you're in, um, say, South Africa or um, or Peru or Argentina, Chile, it's going to be very high up in the in the sky. Um, from, from Peru, it would be nearly overhead. From Peru, it should pass basically through the zenith. Um, so, yeah, so if there's anybody out there and you've got a scope from Peru and you can get it into a hangout, you, know, you, can, you can give us kind of the optimal view of Saturn through the least amount of atmosphere. I'm going to use some company funds, Fraser, and go to Peru. Go to Peru, yeah. <laughs> I've been Virtual there. star party from Machu Picchu. Yeah. Down. yeah. That'd be cool. That'd be tough. For science. Oh, yeah, would. I'm going to move to Roy's view again. Whoa. That is M13, a globular cluster. Nicely said. Very good. <laughs> I am going to infect you all, aren't I? <laughs> Have anyone, has anyone caught themselves saying it my way? Which my, Michael my has. My students started going back and forth in class because I've had them, you know, watching virtual star parties for extra credit, and so yeah. yeah, they would, they would end up going back and forth between globular and globular. Now, now Michael has has dug up a pronunciation guide and proven that it can be both ways. Yes. You can thank my kids for that one, actually. That was that was kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, two ways, you know, the right way or the wrong way, right? <laughs> nice. Yeah. They don't tell you which one is which, though. Right. You're going to battle out on your own, see? Now, now, Roy, did you crop this image of M13 at all, or is this, uh, no, that's, is this that's, just your full field of view? Yep, it's full field of view. <sighs> and it is such a large glob- uh, globular... Or globular cluster, <laughs> um, and it's it's relatively nearby. If I remember the distance correctly, it's, it's something around it's right around thirteen thousand to fifteen thousand light years, if I remember correctly. That, that um, is very nice, Roy. So yeah, Thank nice, you. nice and sharp, and yeah. um, you know we're looking at between half a million and and a million stars when we're looking at a, a, a globular or globular of this size. <laughs> pick one, just so. pick one. Either one's valid. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, and again, one of the oldest objects that's visible to the, the naked eye. They tend to be left over from the, the early f- stages of the formation of the galaxy. In fact, they may have been another galaxy that uh, had interacted with, with the Milky Way, and so it could be the core of a, of a nascent galaxy that's, that's kind of left floating around that was you know, massive enough to hold 
together this way um, and retain an identity out in the halo around our galaxy. So if you look at our galaxy like a, a plane, you have these globular clusters that are kind of scattered around the, the center. Um, and yeah, so that not all the stars ended up getting stripped out of it to become part of the galaxy that has enough mass to kind of retain its own identity 13 billion years later. I'm going to move to Gary's view now. Okay. This is it. This is your favorite, Dad. Yep, the owl and, uh, and the pussycat. <laughs> so, all right. So, yeah, M M97 <laughs> for the Owl Nebula and M108. We'll go with the pussycat galaxy for it. So, uh, here in uh, Ursa Major, so this is going to be really high overhead for those of us out here in, in L.A. This is getting as close to the zenith um, as it would get at about this time of night. Uh, so very nicely placed, and especially with the moon not quite up here yet. I mean, I'd be able to see it out the, the window here from uh, from where I'm, I'm broadcasting. Don't see it up yet, so no interference with our planetary nebula in the upper left corner or our spiral galaxy down in the, the lower right. That's great. And I can also zoom a little bit on the nebula. Now, what what do they think is forming these these eyeballs in the in the nebula? With any planetary nebula, you're looking at the what happens when a star like our sun dies, and so it's never, you know, quite as as neat and as clean a process as just oh, it just kind of puffs out its outer layers and fades away. It can be done in stages, so you could get one set of gas and dust kind of going out first, and then as it starts to die, the the it could be a greater um, pressure on the next layer and so as that rushes out it catches up with the stuff that's already out there so this is how you get features like the stingray nebula or the cat's eye nebula in this case the um, it's given us these kind of two somewhat hollower structures inside the the planetary which look like a pair of owls eyeballs kind of staring back at us yeah. from space yeah that's great um, I'm gonna go back and see Michael is going after moons again Yes, I am. So I'm going to move back to this view of Saturn, which we've got it currently very overly bright, but then I, you can see with Mitchell's view, it's uh, properly bright. I think I spot at least three. There's one here. There's another one over there. And there's another one off to the other side. Over yeah, that we saw before. Here. There it is. Let me see if I can bring up Skyview Cafe and get some identifications on these. I know there's other programs. I mean, Stellarium, I found, tends to have a bit of a lag. I don't know if they've updated that, but I don't think it accounts for the finite um, speed of light that it takes for, um, oh, for wow. images. There might be another travel. one right here, too. Oh, let's see here. Hold on. Well, it's, Come back to your view. got enough things ordering yeah. it, that's for sure. Right. And then you know they'll they'll change a little over uh, how far how far in light hours is Saturn? That's, that's just over a light question. hour. Yeah, just one. Saturn, okay. at, at opposition, Saturn is 72 light minutes away. Um, we're just past opposition, so what you're seeing is as Saturn as it appeared about 75 minutes ago. Trippy. Centurion Legion Logan says, "Oh my God, so much knowledge! I love it." And uh, that reminds me of a comment that we at one point had where someone had said, like, this is the nerdiest thing I have ever seen. <laughs> yes. And I love it. So, yes. yeah. yeah. It is absolutely the nerdiest thing you will ever see. Um, uh, Helen Reed is as asks patiently every week for the Backwards Five asterism in Hercules. Really? And she's Gary? even provided the RA and declaration. <laughs> <laughs> so what's no what's it gonna take? Guys. Should no I just excuses. put this into the chat here? We'll take what's, a crack the, at uh, what's the yeah. size of it? It's I'm sure it's gigantic and we'll um, yeah, I'll so blow out here. But try, just move to move to this and see what you get. Although that's not very not enough precision, I think. <laughs> Sixteen hours, thirty six yeah. minutes. Mm -hmm. Zero Let's seconds. Thirty-six point zero. That's pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, can you guys give it a try and see what we get? I'm all right now. Good, big enough field of view. Yeah. So real quick, I did want to put up some more um, of our. Oh yeah. Okay. Of our images. This one is by our good friend Mike Rector, and what I'll be doing as well is making um, a bunch of wallpapers, a bunch of desktop wallpapers for your. PC, your Mac, also I'm trying to put some together for Android and iOS. 
but this one is of Pleiades. Oh, very and nice. nice. Phenomenal. Nice job, Mike. Yeah. Mike did a great, great job. Like you see the nebulosity. Yeah, there. and that's yeah. not that easy to pull out. So he did a good job. Really good job. So I'll be processing these through with a little bit of a VSP logo and his, you know, his copyright that it's his image yep. on there. And we'll be sharing it up there on Google Plus, on Twitter, on our Facebook. Nice. And if we can commandeer our website from Roy, um, <laughs> we'll get... right, right. Roy is still squatting, right? Um, well, and speaking of Roy, oh nice. What's your image, Roy? This is what is this one? M sixty four. M sixty four. Black eye. Sixty four, isn't it? That's the Black Eye yes. Galaxy. Yeah, sixty four. Yeah. Gorgeous, Roy. Oh, that's nice. Uh, BTL seven forty three, our super fan, uh, wants to know if anyone has seen the conjunction tonight. I was just photographing it. Did you? You saw it? Yeah. Yeah. It's all free. Did you go to your laundry room? Uh, actually, I can see it from the backyard now. I don't. It's, uh, oh, okay. it's got enough elevation. Up. Earlier this week, I had to go up to the second story. To, to see it up over the houses. So. I'm going to be going to the to the west coast on Friday, and so I won't be able to see the conjunction, but hopefully I'll be able to see something. What will I be able to see on Friday, David? It's it's still going to be visible. They're they're going to change orientation. Jupiter's kind of sliding down behind the sun. Okay. Mercury's coming up. So, uh, but they're still going to be visible all week. They're just going to be they're not going to be in that triangle shape anymore. I I will admit I have never seen Mercury with my own eyes. You're saying that this is this is the week to see it. It's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice treat. Well, because the thing is, it's like I have a mountain range on my western side, That's so cool. it is always a mountain. So, and I don't wake up early enough to see it this, in the morning. This is the best. Uh, th this particular elongation is the best one for the northern hemisphere for 2013. It's because it's got to be right perpendicular yeah. to the horizon. So, so I will I will try to see it on Friday night. Yeah. And we said yeah, and the and they're the closest grouping till twenty twenty one, right? That's what that's what they're saying. I never yeah. had a chance to really check that out, but I, but what that do they sounds know? Sounds right. That Them. sounds right. It could be. Yeah. <laughs> And if you have a chance to view it from closer to the equator, I mean, it's it can be especially almost disconcerting if you know anything, if you you know well not know anything, but if you're familiar with where Mercury typically appears in the sky, because two years ago I was in uh, Botswana, which is at about 20 degrees south latitude, and Mercury was hanging around for about two hours after sunset. It's like this planet never does this. What's going? Oh, because I'm you know much closer to the equator and yeah, you're uh, to the south of it. The planet. And, right. Yeah, yeah, and so the way the ecliptic was coming into the horizon at that, that time, Mercury hung around until at least two hours after, wow. after sunset. So so nice and, and so it got nice and dark and you could really see it. Yeah, I have a, I have a shot of it um, right adjacent to the Beehive Cluster M44 that I took with my brother's um, Canon oh, wow. TI-1. Oh, neat. So, yeah. I'm going to move to Gary's view. Is this the backwards five, Gary? This is the backward five. I'm trying to figure out where it's a five. <laughs> well, I think that's... I see it. I see it's it. It's kind of upside yeah. down. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Oh, there's, a, there's a big loopy thing oh, cool. of stars there, too. Yeah, so. that's it. That's for sure yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Let me put it back the way it was here. Yeah, that's the way I took it. Yeah, so yeah. if you rotate it counterclockwise one time, 90 degrees. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see it. Oh, I see it. No, no, wait. No, the other way. <laughs> yeah, clock. Go, go 180 degrees. 180, yeah. Yeah. There we go. Oh, oh back. No, I've lost it. <laughs> I see it. Go 90 <laughs> degrees. The, the hook to the left side there, I mean, that's yeah. near, near the center. That's the that's like the belly of the five. When yeah. you're talking how to draw a five yeah. when you're a kid, they say there's the belly yeah. and you put the little hat on it. Right? <laughs> so the belly is pointing upward in the, the shot here, and it's just to the, the left of center. So, so the lesson that we've learned here is that if you bring the uh, right ascension declination, you stand a really good chance of us uh, bringing it up. Do your homework, kids, and yeah. we'll, we'll try to get it up for you. <laughs> yeah. And I know Helen has been trying to get I know, I know. I'm so glad we were able to provide it for her. There Especially you are, with, Helen. With the setup these guys have here, like uh, Gary and and David and, and Roy with, you know, um, the automation that they have to have to run their scopes is it is essentially putting in a pair of coordinates on the sky. So it's like if you go to Google Maps or something and you were to put in here's my longitude and latitude that I want to get to or get a view of, it brings it up. They can do that with putting in a pair of coordinates, right ascension and declination to the telescope, and the telescope will then point at whatever pair of coordinates you give it. So yeah, it's um, it's quite a handy setup to have there. So. 
Uh, we've got a request for NGC 1569. Mm, very early morning at this point. Yeah. What was yeah, that? I mean, we're, we're, that's going to be... Yeah, that's... <clears throat> uh, not, that's the not Dwarf well Irregular Galaxy in Camelopardalus. Mm, not a good time of year for it. Yeah. Come with NGCs in the 4,000s to 6,000s right about now. Then we can do those very well. Like, for instance... Oh, is that like your, just your quick way of knowing whether it's visible or not? Yeah, I mean, they, they start the NGC numbering at zero hours right ascension, which is like Pisces, that's where the, the vernal equinox is. And so since we're just past vernal equinox now, that means vernal equinox will be up very early in the morning. So, like, for instance... Um, the Orion Nebula is, is 1976, NGC 1976. So anything that's in that region of the sky, I mean, that's about where the sun is right now. Not a good time for trying to see it. Um, as opposed to, it looks like um, Roy right now has 4565. Yeah, I just put up Roy's view here of NGC 4565. Yes, right. Is that the needle, right? That's cool. So, yeah, so this is almost overhead for us at this time of year, maybe a little bit past the, the zenith. You know, so if, you, if you're going to bring up NGC numbers, if you're coming during the summer, you know, late 4,000s through 7,000s are good. If you're coming during the winter, um, right around zero through about 2,000 is good. So. Mm. That's, that's handy. Mm. I, I didn't know that. I thought they were completely random, like the Messier numbers. No, they, they, there's actually some systematics to uh, to NGC versus, you know, good old Charles there hunting comments like, oh, the Pleiades, yeah, okay, that's not a comet, that's 45. Yeah. All right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So it was more like just as he found them, he... Yeah. Yeah. Or it even uh, seems kind of whimsical. I mean, if you think about M1, which is the Crab Nebula is in Taurus, that's not that far from the Pleiades, which is M45. So it's it, it, there's yeah, it'd be an interesting bit of astronomical history, trying to to determine uh, Messier's rhyme or reason for his numbering. You know, an interesting thought in that age. Didn't they just set the telescope at one elevation and let it scan through the night and then move it the next night? Not a lot sure. of times they looked right along the meridian, like they just had transit instruments. So yeah, they would just view on the on the meridian and let things drift through. Right, and then they move it up a degree or two, and the next night look I, at another swatch. Uh, Elliot Elliot K wants to know if we can see the Sombrero Galaxy. I believe we can. Yes, I have that. Should oh, do you have it? Here for it. Okay, I have that. Let me uh, let me pull it up here. Give it another six weeks, and we probably won't be able to anymore. But, but um, now it's a good time of year for it. And while we're waiting for that, David, you've got uh, a region of the moon here. Yeah, is this the Apollo the, Eleven landing site? Yes, yes, it is. It's it's, it's, it's uh, this is a sea of tranquility. I always know from right about up in the upper right side. There's those uh, Sabine, the two pair of craters right there. Right, so and there's that really crater. bright crater in the same yeah. region. Yeah. So the the landing site is roughly above, just above into the right of center. And you know what's interesting? So uh, Teal Bristra spotted it. Oh, very so, cool. Good, yeah. Too. Yeah. So he's watching us. Teal often brings us the sun, which is so awesome that we can have both the sun and the moon and planets all at the same time. Speaking of the sun, have you seen the, the stuff that, uh, that uh, Mr. Schmitz has been doing this week? Corey? Yeah, he's been doing some amazing views of the sun, doing them live on Google+. Plus. I did uh, did one with him, was it last week? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, so if you haven't already, add Corey Schmitz on your, you know, on your Google Pluses and, uh, and, and take a look at some of the live sun views he's been doing. Just beautiful. Yeah, Corey's good people, and he's got a new telescope, so he's always playing with yeah. it. And, but speaking of the sun, I do want to pull up another one, because I... You guys have given us given me so many images to go through. I can't <laughs> pick one that, yeah. and I'm not going to. I'm going to be picking a whole lot of them, and it'll be highlighting a lot of them. But this one here, I just can't help. It's and I went to so just awesome. quickly. I went to Roy's view of the, of the uh, Sombrero Galaxy. So, so as requested, uh, Elliot uh, Roy was able to target the Sombrero Galaxy for you. So, uh, no, it's not a ridiculous question. You actually, it is the right time of year. This is the trick. So, so the kinds of galaxies that we can actually see, or the objects, just all depends on what's up in the night sky right now. So right now we're seeing Saturn, and that's why we've got multiple views of Saturn. The moon is up right now. It'll, it'll be gone in a couple of days. And these are the galaxies that we're able to see right now. 
but we can't see, say, Andromeda right now, and we can't see other some of the sort of later summer stuff. So it just and the Orion Nebula is gone, but we're about to see the Eagle Nebula. So it just depends on what's up in the sky. So thank you very much for asking. Here is one of the submissions. All right, so looking, I'm, yeah, I'm, so I'm showing the sun view. Wow! Oh, it's Paul Stewart. Of course, you know. Yeah, he is a did ridiculously good solar observer. Yeah, I mean, it just. You can just see so much activity. You can check out on. his website. He's the upside down astronomer. Upside down astronomer. Yeah, and he's right. out of uh, he's out of New Zealand. New Zealand. And yeah. like, one more image of the sun too, because I you can't <clears throat> help but love this image coming through. If I can pull it up. Better hurry, because now we're just looking at you. Just looking. at... I'm pretty. <laughs> and so we actually see the sun and the International Space Station. International Space That's Station. That's cool. Going whose whose picture is this? This is Russell. I cannot Bateman? pronounce his last name. No. I will. Russ starts with a V. I will slaughter your name, and I'm sorry, Russ. Val Valle Lunga. Oh, okay. That's uh, crazy. Yeah, he, he he he'd been trying to do some some really uh, Valle Lunga. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's he's done some amazing of these these uh, kind of timing shots. He had one from earlier this month where he caught the moon at about one percent illumination. Right. Yeah. which is incredibly tough to do, just 26 hours old. Um, he was able to use Venus as a guide, and it's like less than a fingernail of a, of wow. a crescent moon. Right. So, uh, the ab absolute master of this is a guy named uh, Thierry Legault. He's out of uh, Paris, yeah. and his his images are just crazy. Oh, Michael says that trees kill the Saturn. Yes. <laughs> so here, 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 this is what I'll post in the photos later when I get back inside. This is now, a, is this stacked stack. or is this just raw? Is yeah, this, this, a is, this is a stack and a, and a, and a basic sharpen. Yeah. So, oh, that's, that's pretty. Not my best, but it looks pretty good. It's quick and dirty. Right. <laughs> it's good enough for us. Yes, exactly. Gary, what have you got here? Oh. Uh, M63, but my seeing's not real great. You can start to see some of the uh, spiral arms yeah. in the galaxy. Oh yeah. yeah, M sixty three is the sunflower galaxy, and I mean we talk about how tightly spirals wind, and is, this is one of those things. It's like, well, you know, if you ask about Saturn, how many rings does Saturn have? Well, you know, if you look roughly from a, a shot, you might say, well, there's the A and B rings that are separated by Cassini's division. Oh, but wait, there's the C ring in front of Saturn. Oh wait, we have pictures from Voyager and from Cassini that show it has thousands of rings. How many arms? Does the Sunflower Galaxy have? Okay, well, I mean, there's there's maybe three or four that kind of stand out, but as you look closer, you see all of this modeling and uh, modeling M O T T L I N G, um, where the, you just got all these little knots of of gas that are um, condensing, you know, these really incredible star forming regions, and it really looks like kind of the interior of a of a sunflower on longer exposures. Right. So, Tom, and I'm shooting with hydrogen alpha, we're seeing the light of hydrogen too. So right. Tom right. Nath has asked for the Stargate cluster, and he's provided the uh, Stargate cluster. The Stargate cluster. cluster. He's provided okay. here. So it's uh, 12 hours, going? 35 minutes, 59 seconds, declination minus 12.03. So. Is that going to bring any aliens? In the I let's hope not. Uh, I'll yeah. go try to activate that. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> awesome. All right. That's really, that's really near the sombrero. That's, That's pretty close, yeah. So yeah. is the sombrero just a giant stargate that we should be worried about? Uh -huh. So I've moved to Roy's view. Now Roy and Roy and Gary are just hitting us with these deep sky objects. This is great. Um, so this is M101 from yeah. Roy. Yes. So pinwheel galaxy in Ursa Major just off of the, the handle kind of forms a triangle with the end of the handle is either Alcade or Bennett Nash, two names for that star. The middle of the handle is Mizar, and then this kind of forms a... a almost a right triangle with those two stars. So brilliant, gorgeous, giant um, spiral galaxy about 18 million light years off and very face on. I mean, we, we yeah. can see like the sombrero is edge on. This is very much face on. Right. Now, it looks like it's had one of its spiral arms just kind of yanked out of it, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's something that would hint at maybe a collision. We don't 
there's nothing nearby in you know um, that we would see could have possibly done that. The other thing is the way spiral arms evolve is is pretty complex. This whole theory of spiral density waves, where some materials orbiting kind of catches up with some others, and it's like a you know a, a traffic jam. And here in LA, of course, it's a great analogy, where you you may just have cars that bunch up for some reason, and then as cars pass in and pass out, the the cars pass through just fine, but the kind of jam stays in that part of the road as, as cars have to slow down to enter yeah. and leave. And that's that seems to be one of the large uh, mechanisms, one of the, the, the explanations for how galaxies develop their spiral arms is that you, you have places where um, things just tend to bunch up as they're uh, passing through at their, uh, their various speeds here. Now, of course, they will have extra mass. Extra mass means extra gravity. So that could provide... Oh. Um, a physical reason these things hang around a little bit longer as well. Very cool. That's a beautiful image. Oh, yeah. And Mike, are you now playing with your image of Saturn? <laughs> yeah, I just figured it was looking angelic floating above my head or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the picture in picture in Manicam, by the way, which is what I use tonight. So. Oh, that's great. Oh. And so, this is great. I love it. David's view, too. This is great, David. You can see <laughs> David's telescope in the background I, there. I, I lost the moon temporarily behind the peak of the house. So it'll be happens. back, and I, I wondered why. It's like, hey, the camera's going black, so I went and cleaned off the fog from the front of the scope. It was right. still black, and then I looked. It's like, oh, it's because the moon went behind the roof. That's <laughs> almost a, that's almost the same exact problem I had. I'm like, I switched cams back to the color okay. camera, and I'm like, where did it go? I can't find it. I'm like, oh, it's oh, behind the tree. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <gasps> that's great. Somebody treed my Saturn. <laughs> uh, and Roy's got another one. Roy, you're so fast. That would be M92. So this is like M13's little brother. Right? The constellation Hercules has a large number of galaxies. It has the Great Globular Cluster in Hercules, but there's also, which is, which is M13 for the Great Globular Cluster. M92 is another globular cluster in Hercules. It doesn't get all the press that M13 does because it's just not quite as big or has quite as many members. But as you can see, it's still something definitely worth looking at here. One of these now, is it just further away, or is it actually a lower mass cluster? Um, it would, I'm fairly certain it has fewer members, but again, you know, M13 is the second biggest globular cluster in the vicinity of the Milky Way. The only bigger one is in Centaurus, um, that's Omega Centauri. So yes, it would have fewer members, but you're still talking a few hundreds of thousands of stars. Yeah. So it's just bottom end of 100,000 to 200,000 as opposed to somewhere between 500,000 and, and a million for M13. Right. That's great. All right, so Gary, is that the Stargate cluster? That is the Stargate cluster. At least that's what the, that is at that coordinates. I think. So is that it's like it's right one here. of the it's one of the symbols on the Stargate? I think so. I think it's right there as the symbol. You know what? I think I might have a shot of this in frame with the sombrero. Hang on a second here. Okay. Put this on my Flickr account. Uh, so Stephen Birch asked if we could see the Horsehead Nebula. So that's one of the objects that we can no longer see. So we were able to see right. it a couple of months ago, and now it's it's set. So well, we won't see it until it's November. It's not entirely true. That's one of our submissions I was going to share tonight too. So are oh, you going to share it? Uh, I will throw that up here real quick. There's here we go. That's cheating. Come on, it's, it's a live it's show. Not cheating. This is going over our submissions from our awesome. That's totally fine. We we've, we're relaxing our stringent requirements. What is that double go. galaxy that the guy keeps seeing there? Oh my God! Look at that. That's phenomenal. Whose is that? That's awesome. This is. Let me pull it back up. I have That's all like my notes. The best one I've ever seen. Amazing. Better better than Hubble. Wow. Ooh, yeah, this that is, is a nice Stephen interacting pair. Cotus. Yeah. Cotus. Oh, he's, real the, he's the man. Yes. Yeah, it's good. Even as a man. Uh, I'm going to move to Roy's view. Uh, is that the butterfly? This is the, I don't know what you would call it. It's it's On my map, it's listed as the Siamese Twins. Wow. It's uh, NGC 4567. I like that. That's cool. Galaxy. Let me, uh, galaxies. Let me, are they, are they, they gravitationally it? interacting? Yeah, I'm it's called the Siamese in. Twins or the Butterfly Galaxies. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yes, they are colliding and merging with each other. Awesome. So this is probably an ARP catalog object as well, then. Um, uh, that I don't probably. know. Probably. 
So, I mean, M51 shows up in the ARP catalog, if, if and that's that's not even as big of a train wreck as this thing here, so. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't see an ARP designation for it. Hmm. Hmm. I learned something have... interesting today. Uh, we went to the Moorhead Planetarium, and apparently Caldwell, speaking of catalogs, um, was a part of UNC Chapel Hill, which I didn't realize. So they have a whole little wing dedicated to, you know, history of observations at UNC Chapel Hill, and there's Caldwell all over the place. Nice. Quick, somebody pull a Caldwell object up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we probably already have, haven't we? Yeah, prob- I've, some of these are doubled, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I think it's time to start wrapping this up. Good, because I'm out of objects. Yeah. <laughs> that means <laughs> David, David's got the... M- oh, no, that's not your roof. That's the moon. But, yeah. I'm trying to get it a little bit, just, yeah. just getting the upper limb of it. It's still All right, so, good. Andrew, thank you very much. Sorry about your telescope problems. Thank you very much for bringing us this, this cool all-sky view, actually. I really like it. You're welcome. I've... Uh... Almost got a manual animated GIF as I've been. Is <laughs> that what you've been doing? You've Nothing been to do with it. <laughs> well, if you so if you upload all of these three images into your Google Plus photos, like make a, an album and upload them, you will get an animated GIF out of this. Wow, I shall try that. Yeah. Hmm. So Google will will give you a present, and they will auto awesome it for you. Auto awesome. Yeah. Yeah. David. Thank you very much. Any interesting articles you're working on for us? Oh, there's uh, yeah, the phases I mean, of the moon. It's the moon. If you want to see the moon now. Yeah. Well, we've got to uh, move it back and forth to, so people can see what it, the cool thing is. Oh, to actually do the, the animation. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm working on an article probably tomorrow for 1998 QE2, the asteroid that's going to be passing by this week. That's going to be about 10th or 11th magnitude going through Libra on Friday on May 31st. Is that the one that Sandy talked about in the... Uh, Yes, it is. In the yeah. Ver- yeah, yeah, on the, the week's Air, Air, yeah. Arecibo is going to be pinging that asteroid. This, this is the closest pass for this century. It's about 15 Fabulous. lunar distances away. So. And people can see the way that you can uh, they can find more David Dickinson, which is at Astro Guys, and he writes tons of articles for us on Universe Today. So you'll see more of his work. All right. Gary Ganella, thank you very much. And You're... thank you for, uh, for chasing people's uh, personal requests. That's awesome. I, I love that part. Give me more. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, I know it's great to not have to think about what it is that you're looking for. So, yeah, that's great. All right. And, Michael, it was great to see you again. I was happy to be back and, here. And it was great guys. to bring the Saturn. Yes. Which yeah, I think back, has a, Michael. you know, it's like Thank our... You. Yeah, welcome back. <laughs> so, over here. Yeah, so Gary, Michael, me in the... So we're just missing Pamela. But we're the yeah. people who are in the... We're getting the, the band back together, man. Yeah. Band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, uh, Centurion Logan says, I just found your channel today. What is the schedule for this show? So we do this show every... Uh, Sunday night when it gets dark on the West Coast. So in the in the summertime, that ends up being we're pretty close to the solstice now. That ends up being around 9:30 Pacific, 12:30 uh, Eastern time. And then in the winter time, it's more like uh, five Pacific, eight Eastern. So right, yeah, it's not so bad. Um, Roy Salisbury, and sorry we can't see you. I know you're, no. uh, but it's but it's great that you're on location working the. Making the magic. And boy, I mean, your images are just fantastic. It's been great to see this sort of the this new setup. Yeah, I'm, I'm really liking this new telescope. I just got a few more little tweaks to do. Yeah. And, uh, it should be fully operational. Terrific. All right. Scott Lewis, where can people sort of see the results of this photo uh, contest? I will be still editing some stuff in Photoshop to get them ready at different resolutions. So I will make sure to put them up on Google Plus. I will also put them up temporarily on my website, on knowthecosmos.com, once I have them all compiled. I have already put the photos up as far as our banner on the Virtual Star Party Facebook and Google Plus account. And as soon as more goes on, I will be swapping out some of our icons as we go along and you know, really filtering through, through a lot of these images that have been submitted by all, of, all the great people here on Google Plus. All right, and Dr. Zabo, where can people take your course? At uh, Cerritos College in Norwalk, California, or you can follow me on Twitter uh, at AstroThad. Awesome. Uh, yep, and I'll yeah, see if I can get some more done over the the summer here. See if I can get some articles out and whatnot. So that'll be great. All right. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thank you very much, all the astronomers, and uh, and uh, 
everyone for joining us in here in the Hangout. It's great. And so tomorrow, I think we're going to be recording an episode of Astronomy Cast. Planetary motion, I believe, is what we're going to be talking about. So, um, and then learning space on Wednesday, uh, and then the weekly space hangout on Friday. So it's got lots of cool space stuff coming your way. All right, enjoy the beard. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you guys all. Uh, we'll see you guys all next week. Bye.